Okay, so let me uh, finish with snapshot isolation. Uh, so I'll say a few things that I didn't have time to say uh, in the previous lecture. Um, so again, I'm present I've presented you this abstract algorithm and the picture here is that snapshot isolation is defined as the set of uh, all histories that are produced by this algorithm, right? And then a database is SI. If any history that it produces can also be produced by, by the algorithm. And as I said before, the implementation can be completely different from this uh, abstract algorithm, right? So the only requirement is that it produces matching histories. Uh, in particular, the timestamps uh, that are, are used inside this algorithm, they're invisible to, to the clients, right? So the real implementation uh, can pick them in whatever way it likes, as long as the histories are the same, right? Um, and uh, Okay, let me see, uh, what did I, I'll have to jump a bit because I don't remember what I covered here and what I didn't cover here. Right, okay, so uh, again, the key rule that we've uh, argued a bit over is this right conflict detection, right? That uh, if I uh, commit, try to commit a transaction, I have to check if during its lifetime somebody also wrote uh, to the same object uh, as this transaction. Oh, sorry. Right, and one, one thing is that, as I said before, uh, this algorithm is uh, non-deterministic. Uh, in particular, uh, actually the algorithm allows uh, to abort this transaction T, even if this conflict check uh, passes. Uh, so it makes sense from the implementation perspective because sometimes these conflicts are detected approximately, for example, at the page level uh, in the database, not at the level of a particular row of an object. And so it gives, this gives the uh, the actual implementation, the flexibility to uh, abort uh, some transactions, even though in theory it could commit uh, this transaction, right? And as before, as you, with serializability, in principle, you could abort uh, every transaction, of course, and uh, if you want, you need to place extra constraints uh, on liveness uh, to ensure that some transactions will always be uh, committed. Okay, and so uh, lost update is disallowed, uh, and uh, let me let me continue. Um, okay, right, skew, we covered this. Uh, right, okay, and so as I said, the R, you can use select for update to R selectively disallow the right skew. And I didn't have time to mention that there is also actually another way, uh, which is you could just, uh, uh, what databases allow you to do is also to set the isolation level on a per transaction basis. So if you aren't yet completely confused with these different Isolation levels, uh, apart from like setting it on for the whole database, you could also set them at different granularity. For example, you could require this these particular transactions uh, to run on serializable isolation level uh, and the rest of the transactions in your system to run on snapshot isolation. So what it means in terms of uh, our abstract algorithm is that uh, for if I ask uh, the database to execute T2 at the serializable level, that means that our, this database will actually validate the reads of this transaction, right? So when T2 um, goes to commit, this is our uh, history from, this is our execution from the lost update example. Uh, when T2 tries to uh, commit, uh, then apart from doing the write conflict detection, I'll also do the read conflict detection. So I'll check if there's any read by this uh, transaction that is also uh, been overwritten uh, by some write during its lifetime of T2, and in this case, uh, I'll have to abort the transaction, okay? Um, okay, so let me uh, do a, a small test. So here's another example. Uh, it's called Lone Fork. The name is strange, but it, it doesn't matter. Um, so let's do a quiz if it's allowed by serializability or snapshot isolation. So let me describe what, what's happening here. Uh, so we have our four transactions. Uh, so two of them, they write some objects. So uh, T1 writes uh, to object X, uh, T2 writes to object Y. So these are writing transactions. And then you have our, a pair of other reading transactions. And so what they do is they read both objects, X and Y. And so transaction T3, uh, it reads uh, object X, uh, reads one, so sees the write that was done. And then reads object Y, uh, doesn't see any write, gets the default value zero. And then the transaction T4, it does the reverse. It uh, reads uh, zero from X and uh, reads one from Y. Okay, so I guess the first question is, is this serializable? Okay, so some people are uh, nodding in the case, okay, so maybe you can explain to me why. Um, so, um, I, I'm not 
sure I can give him some formal explanation of that. Uh, but I think that uh, it doesn't cost it to be uh, to do that serializable because it's kind of a scenario that we have is uh, a few right I think. Yeah, correct. Yeah, so yeah, so let's. Uh, I mean, so formally speaking, it's very easy. You just for to check your list, you do enumerate all possible orders, right? Now you can be just slightly smarter. Let's, let's enumerate orders for T1 and T2, right? So put them in some order. So let's try, you know, T1 first, T2 second, right? So as you said, you have to execute them in some order. Then serializability. Okay, well, we have uh, T4. Uh, it reads uh, one from Y, so that means it has to come after T2, right? Because uh, you know. So, so I have to put t t4 over here, uh, but then uh, okay, so then it's fine. But then the uh, the read from x is invalid because there is a, um, a read from x over here. So, so write to x over here. So read from x over here, right? So okay, with serializability, all the transactions they execute in a single timeline, and you see some prefix of this timeline, right? So you cannot like see things selectively, right? And if I flip t1 and t2, then again you can you can check that because it's completely symmetric. You can check that uh, that you get the same outcome. Okay. Uh, so let me. Uh, okay. Oh, actually, sorry. Let me. Uh, okay. Uh, then okay. So is that everybody's clear? Does anybody wants to ask a question? No. Okay. So, is this not, does this satisfy snapshot isolation? That next question. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, no, because to, to see this lattice, it really should start uh, after T1 committed, but before T2 committed, and T4 should start after uh, T2 committed, but before T1 committed. And, uh, and th th this means, like, we have a contradiction. Uh, yeah, so, so essentially snapshot isolation is kind of very similar to serializability in this respect, that transactions commit on a single timeline, and you have to see a prefix of this timeline, right? So you, again, you cannot selectively, uh, you know, pick and choose. Okay, so let's just uh, maybe go over over this uh, kind of a bit more, a bit slowly. Uh, so uh, again, T1 and T2, they have to commit in some order, as you were talking about. Let's pick some order in which they commit. Let's say T1 commits first, T2 commits second. Uh, right, uh, and then uh, we have T4, the same story as before. T4 uh, reads one from Y, so sees the write by uh, T2. Uh, right, what this means is that uh, the, wait, what is this? Uh, yeah, that means that the start timestamp of T4 has to be uh, after the commit timestamp of T2. Otherwise, by the rule for reads and snapshot isolation, you wouldn't see the write uh, T2, right? Um, and then, um, uh, T4 has to also, uh, well, you always read from the snapshot, right? The snapshot is up to here, so you see all the writes before it, so you'll see also see this write from X, right? And so you have to read one from X and not zero, right? Snapshot isolation. Is everybody okay with that? Panagiotto looks, looks miserable. Uh, you know, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Yeah, everything is fine. Okay. Uh, Okay, uh, okay, fine. Uh, okay, and then if you take the reverse, then okay, let, let's, I won't bore you with this, you, you get the same thing. So, uh, so this is disallowed even on the snapshot isolation because uh, all snapshots are taken from a single global timeline. Actually, this example, so I've, I've seen it confusing developers, which is why I kind of, uh, they think, oh no, this, this is allowed on the snapshot isolation. Um, right, um, and so uh, here, write conflict detection doesn't actually play a role because uh, no two transactions uh, write to the same object and nevertheless, this is disallowed. Um, this example actually is allowed by something called causal consistency, which is this uh, level that's more like uh, used in NoSQL uh, data stores that I'm not going to uh, talk about and by uh, some other things like parallel snapshot isolation that were proposed in academic literature. Uh, okay, but anyway, this example was a bit of a test for you. Uh, and so now we get to our anomaly checklist for, uh, for snapshot isolation. So out of the examples we've, uh, we've seen so far, uh, everything disallowed except for the right skew, right? But again, uh, I want to emphasize that uh, these are just examples. So this is not the definition. The definition is given by the abstract algorithm, uh, not by examples, because uh, you know, with examples, I showed you this example of a right skew, but again, I can generate these examples uh, you know, uh, more and more. You know, I sort of drew something on a piece of paper and generated an example with three transactions that kind of follows the same logic, right? So in principle, I can, uh, you, know, I cannot, you cannot define this using examples. 
Uh, you had a question? Yeah. Let me just answer that. Uh, my question was exactly about, like, can we maybe just hypothetically, is it possible to maybe somehow formalize these uh, anomalies and maybe somehow do kind of reduction where, you know, for any execution that, for example, by less central population, we would be able to kind of point to one of these anomalies? Yeah, so. I, we had a, I had a paper about this in 2016, uh, but it had a lot of Greek, so I decided not to talk about it. Right, so yeah, so essentially what we show is that all anomalies under snapshot isolation are right skew wish. Now I can explain to you offline what that means. So sort of similar to this example, right? Now there is some theory are kind of, that people, there's some alternative way in which people use um, to define uh, consistent models that you can use to characterize these anomalies, but this is sort of out of scope of what I'm going to be talking about. So if you want, I can kind of talk, talk about this offline. Okay. Um, okay. And so our, so overall, uh, snapshot isolation in principle is kind of more or less reasonable trade-off between, uh, between performance and programmability. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you some weirder stuff in later, and in comparison to it, snapshot isolation isn't too bad. Um, so actually, sometimes it's even called uh, strong consistency as well, especially when people talk about kind of eventual consistency. So anything that disallows lost updates, they call it strong consistency. Um, and some applications, uh, actually, uh, when you execute them under a snapshot isolation, they may produce actually only serializable histories, so just because they don't have configurations that would lead to something like write skews. And the very famous examples is TPCC, which is a uh, the most famous benchmark that uh, that all the vendors use to uh, report performance numbers for their for their databases, um, and we can also avoid anomalies using uh, select for update uh, selectively or by selectively uh, marking transactions as serializable. So actually, there are also academic guidelines on how to are. Uh, uh, use these kinds of tools like select for update in a systematic way to get only serializable behaviors on the snapshot isolation, but hopefully with better performance because you're not using them for each for all transactions. So there is a paper like this by uh, Alan Fekete. Um, but uh, these academic guidelines, and it's a bit unclear to what extent the industry is aware of them. So as a uh, it's a funny story, the um, Postgres for a while didn't have a serializability implementation, so the highest level they provided was snapshot isolation. And when they uh, did it, uh, that was in 2012, and they actually published a paper about this, uh, the authors were Dan Ports, he's a famous systems guy, and somebody, I don't know who, from Wisconsin Supreme Court. And uh, the reason is that uh, they said that, uh, you know, the Wisconsin Supreme Court had an issue with, uh, you know, weak isolation because that data integrity is a critical concern given the nature of the data, e.g. warrant status information and regulatory requirements. And snapshot isolation anomaly is posed a dangerous threat to data integrity, especially because they can cause silent uh, corruption. So they don't mention if this means that somebody got a warrant when, when they didn't have to. But, but, uh, but this, was the, uh, this was the use case for implementing serializability and Postgres. But uh, on the overall, it doesn't seem like serializability is very popular in industry. I think nobody really uses it uh, unless they are a Wisconsin Supreme Court or something else, unfortunately. Yeah. Oh, this is a uh, this is a way. So they they use a very interesting. Okay, I don't have time to talk about it. This is a very they use a very interesting way of implementing snap uh, of implementing serializability, which is to um to use snapshot isolation and then put a monitor using these criteria of Alan Fekete that monitors executions and it de completely detect and completely detect non serializable behaviors. And if it detects something, then it aborts starts aborting transactions. And this actually performs better than just you know, two-phase locking uh, under many workloads. So the Borges is a very interesting implementation, but I, you know, I, I don't have. Uh, so actually, this is a case where they did an implementation. In, so the realizable snapshot was a previous academic paper. So this is the case where they took an academic paper and actually put it into production. Okay. Uh, okay. Now I'm gonna briefly uh, describe some of the weirder uh, stuff. Uh, there will be some more funny, uh, funny stories. So I won't bore you too much with it. And later I'm gonna, you know, talk about something else. Um, so first of all, uh, as I said, uh, in Postgres, SI is so uh, snapshot isolation is provided as a repeatable read, which is one of these names that NSI uh, SQL uh, uses. Um, and in MySQL, which is one of the, you know, the other major open source uh, database, repeatable read is actually uh, something very different. 
Um, but just two are, but it can be defined in one slide using an abstract algorithm. Uh, so I'm going to do this just to illustrate sort of the variety. And this is also the default isolation level in MySQL. Uh, so to recap this uh, snapshot isolation abstract algorithm, uh, I presented to you in a like, bunch of slides, but really it's a, it can be summarized using kind of bullet points, right? So each transaction is associated with uh, start and commit timestamps. Uh, writes are buffered uh, during execution. They are not applied to the database immediately, and they are only added to the database at commit time. And you use commit timestamp uh, to tag them and disambiguate uh, different versions. Uh, then there was a rule for reads, that each transaction serves or reads from a snapshot uh, defined by the start timestamp. Uh, plus its own rights. And then there was the uh, write conflict detection rule, uh, where a transaction can commit only if uh, nobody else uh, wrote to the same data during this transaction's lifetime. And so what my SQL uh, repeatable read algorithm does is just deletes this uh, last uh, clause over here uh, and says we won't do write conflict detection because it's great, we don't have to even acquire write locks, right? And, you know, so, <laughs> just so, so performance, yes, it produces strange outcomes, but you know, but it, but it runs really fast, right? Um, so that means this uh, allows uh, lost updates. Uh, now, you may ask, wait, well, this is really weird how in the, you know, in the world people can program over this thing, right? Uh, well, there is a complicated story, so uh, there is a bit of a uh, fine print here, which is uh, what I've said is true, assuming uh, vanilla select and update statements, right? So without like, anything fancier, right? Um, and uh, more complex statements can actually uh, avoid these uh, updates. Actually, I wanted to, let me just, I'll skip this for a while and uh, let me just, um, uh, let me just uh, first cover this, okay? Uh, so let's say we have our lost update example, right? So our, we can, there are different ways you can actually map this onto SQL, right? If you have to use uh, SQL. Like, so, so one way is the following, which is closest to what I wrote here, uh, which is you implement xplot plus as a transaction with separate read and write, right? So what this means is we open a transaction, uh, we select uh, the value of x, uh, so I wrote it in SQL, so you have some table with some row and you uh, select the value of x, which is some row in this table into some local variable, right? So this is like a stored procedure kind of thing. But then you compute the increment, right? And then you update our, uh, the table and say, okay, now we'll set the, this variable uh, to this new value, which is uh, you know, the previous value plus one, right? And you commit the transaction. So if you, now of course this is idiotic, you, you would never do that, right, in practice uh, for in, an increment, but you would do this if you had some very complex computation over here that you cannot express this in SQL, right? So this is actually something that you may do uh, in practice, okay? And so in this case, if you do this, then you may actually get a, uh, uh, a lost update in, for example, MySQL repeatable read and in some other weaker isolation levels, right? Um, so that's kind of a problem, but uh, the good news is that, our, well, okay, so of course we can always use select for update. Right? Select for update was saving us in the case of snapshot isolation. It may also save us uh, here, so we can say instead of select, uh, we can use for update. Uh, this will essentially treat this read as a write, uh, and in my SQL case, uh, it will turn on uh, the con write conflict detection. Right? And so then uh, it's going to be fine. So in the implementation, what happens is that here you acquire, well, the, the transaction will acquire an exclusive lock on this row and it will hold it until it commits. Right? And so, uh, so, sorry, the read lock on this row and it will hold it until it commits. And then this ensures that you will not get lost updates. Um, and finally, our uh, the, uh, you may also uh, use, uh, well, of course, if you have something s as simple as an increment, you can use it in line in SQL, right? So you can just say update, uh, you know, this table, and uh, for this row where the var variable name is x, you just say, say count equals count plus one, right? And actually, in this case, uh, oh, sorry, uh, in this case, uh, lost update will not happen. So this is another uh, thing that programmers can use to kind of be... Uh, get more sensible behavior, right? And so our, you know, you can use either select for update or these inline computations inside the update uh, to maintain application correctness. Uh, but it's actually quite treacherous uh, because like some search conditions in SQL don't work the way uh, you expect them to work. Uh, so I won't bore you with details, but uh, Postgres some examples about that. Um, and, uh, and so you have for the same kind of a thing. Now let me jump uh, a bit 
The same kind of a thing with weaker isolation levels, right? So this is my this was my SQL repeatable read, right? So you have serializability. Snapshot isolation allows even more histories, and then my SQL repeatable read is over here, so even weaker because we allow uh, lost updates in general. And then there is uh, right, so the again the uh, the directions go this way, so you allow more histories and weaker guarantees here this way, and fewer histories and strong guarantees uh, here. Uh, and then the last thing, or uh, last weak thing I'm going to cover is something called uh, read committed. So this is a really weak level, uh, right? And uh, it's even weaker, right? And uh, the reason why I'm bothering with it is that it's actually default in really many systems, including, uh, you know, SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, you know, all, all kinds of things, right? So this is your famous fav favorite default level. And, uh, and the problem is that, uh, at least uh, according to anecdotic evidence, nobody changes defaults. Uh, so you really need to kind of understand uh, all these subtleties that I've been talking about to realize that maybe you should be like either extra careful or you should maybe increase your isolation level. So this is something that people uh, really have to, uh, to deal with. And read committed was originally uh, defined um, using examples of anomalies, right? And so they were saying, well, uh, you disallow dirty read, uh, so reading from aborted transactions, this is kind of really reading rubbish data. But you allow, uh, you know, fuzzy reads, so it's the same as non-repeatable read. You allow phantoms, uh, right? So all kinds of uh, crazy stuff. And it was originally defined using examples of anomalies in uh, NSI uh, SQL. Uh, there, was a, there is a formal, so this is, the, um, this is the summary, right? So essentially we allow all these di different anomalies that I, that I described to you, they're all allowed by read committed, right? So... Uh, uh, snapshot isolation only allows uh, write skew. Uh, it's, it's just a dir the dirty read is uh, disallowed. Uh, now, of course, this is not a definition. These are just some examples. Uh, there is a correct definition uh, given in this uh, PhD thesis uh, by Adia. I won't even go into it because it's still very weak. Um, uh, but our, you know, th this is pretty bad. Uh, and the only reason why people can program over this thing is the stuff I showed to you before, because usually database provides slightly stronger guarantees for things like select for update or inline uh, SQL computations, right? Uh, okay, uh, and so now our, so all this stuff I've covered before, now the uh, sort of, you may ask, well, this is kind of uh, very complicated, so do developers actually uh, know what they're doing when, when they're program or, uh, over these databases, right? And developers are, in this case, are like everybody, right? So everybody uses these databases to build the, their services. And actually, for a while, it was like, it was kind of unclear, you know, the databases provide all these uh, weird uh, levels. Are applications somehow magically correct when using them? Um, and uh, recently, the, again, in the past few years, there were actually papers that tried to kind of do some studies to analyze this. Uh, so in particular, there was this paper uh, this year, uh, in 2023, um, what they did is they studied the root causes of uh, concurrency bugs in some open source applications uh, using databases. And essentially, like the short answer, they have these like findings and uh, with sort of TLDR and they say, you know, do, do the hoc transactions actually, you know, weakly isolated transactions actually cause anomalies in real applications? We can't say yes. Right, and uh, again, they give this context, which is uh, given that the, this is a very popular solution to use like one of these typical databases on a default isolation levels. Uh, for a while, people thought, well, maybe the concurrency level in the applications is not high enough to reproduce these anomalies. So maybe if these anomalies happen, maybe this doesn't affect the application correctness. Essentially, what these guys are saying is that, yes, it's a problem. So they, they've trolled through a sort of bug databases of open source applications, and they said, yeah, there are lots of stuff, there's lots of stuff uh, where uh, bugs happen because of um, weak isolation anomalies. Um, and uh, I guess one thing is that this, uh, one reason is that uh, apart from the fact that this is all kind of very complicated, it's also not really taught at the undergraduate level all that well, right? So they said that uh, uh, often, if you read the discussions for uh, when people try to correct bugs, they're often, people often are often in this locks mindset. So understand locks, they don't understand isolation levels. So their first reflex is, well, we need to add a lock somewhere rather than maybe we need to either uh, increase our isolation level or use select for update or something like this. And so, 
you know, hopefully the developer education helps. And so they, I'm trying to kind of preach the, uh, the gospel of, uh, you know, isolation levels to you. Um, and so uh, there is a, another funny paper that's from a few years ago. Uh, that's even uh, funnier. So here they uh, used, um, they took a bunch of uh, widely used e-commerce applications. So this is if you use a, uh, any kind of uh, internet store for a small shop, not, not Amazon, they will use one of the off-the-shelf framework for building these stores. Um, and so this stuff runs on MySQL or MariaDB, which is a sort of a, a fork of MySQL. And essentially what these guys are, did is they show that you can use uh, weak the fact that we you run on weak isolation uh, to hack these applications to, for example, give you unbounded orders. You know, you pay for one item, you get 10 instead, right? So, uh, so it's kind of a, a problem. And even uh, applications who try to use select for updates, so the programmers are kind of aware that, uh, you know, they need to do something, they often get it wrong. Okay, uh, so this was the uh, yeah, depressing part. Uh, so I've uh, presented you this uh, small zoo. Uh, there are many more levels, but uh, I've presented a few, right? So, so yeah, yeah, sure. So there were some papers in the uh, sort of programming languages and verification community. Uh, so they were either about uh, can you preserve some invariance, right? So if you say your let's say your application correctness is some invariance, at least you want to have them. Uh, what is the minimal consistency level you require? Which transactions should be marked? Uh, it's like strongly consistent, uh, right? So there was that kind of stuff. Now, whether preserving invariance captures your notion of correctness is, is another story, right? There was another, and there was another line of work where people uh, tried to really say, oh, let's, uh, let's see if our, so there are these criteria that can you, maybe in some applications, if you run them under weak isolation, like snapshot isolation, you get only serializable outcomes. And so you could say, okay, so how can I, let's say I have an application that is, produces unserializable outcomes. What is the minimal set of transactions I need to either mark as serializable or you select for update there uh, to ensure serializability, right? So there were papers like this. They were, they're all in the, mostly in the sort of programming languages community. Uh, they're so far kind of pretty academic. Uh, so, you know. uh, okay, A any other questions? Oh, uh, yeah. So, 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 sorry, louder. I um, well, I don't think separation logic helps here much. I mean, separation logic is uh, for like usually it's used for concurrency to express correctness in general. I mean, in principle, you could use some fancy logic to say my application runs on this isolation level, which is weaker in serializability, let's prove that it's correct uh, right, uh, under this isolation level. I don't think you need separation logic for that. You know, separation logic, the main thing is the star about this, about data structures, right? Here there's no, uh, uh, it's not super helpful. Um, I don't know, what is it? Did you just bring separation logic up by association or do you have some mo something more concrete in, in mind? Uh, Okay, I see. Well, my PhD on says on s is on separation logic, so we can talk about we can talk in after the, after my talk. I'll be happy to. Uh, um, okay, anybody else? Yeah. Um, so, is there do you have any studies that would kind of study the inherent cost of serializability? Uh, because not clear whether okay, the, the premise here, the premise for existing for ex very existence of pretty large levels is that serializability is expensive, but the question is, is it expensive by its nature, or is it expensive just because the implementation are not, are not mm -hmm. So, so I, uh, I remember there were some papers, recent papers in the context of distributed transactions that you, you cannot, uh, they're showing if you want serializability and some other properties, then this is impossible, you'll need to sacrifice something. Uh, I don't, there must be something in the, for more classical settings, but I, 
Uh, I, I don't remember anything off the top of my head. So I think there was something in the context of source transactional memory that people did. Maybe Panagiota would uh, we would know, but uh, off the top of my head, no, I don't remember. Uh, Yeah, so you reduce concurrency for writes. So if you think about the lost update example, then under serializability, if you do more you know, optimistic concurrency control, uh, one of the transactions will have to abort because they're both trying to write at the same time to the same piece of data, right? So one of them will get there first, the other one will fail uh, the read validation and, and abort, right? Um, uh, so, sorry, sorry, no, the... Um, mm, No, no, sorry, let's take the right, no, it's more like the right skew, right, so sorry, I'm using the right, so the right, so let's take the right skew, right, so on the serializ so on the serializability there, you would have to abort transactions because read validation failed. Right, so, so in right skew there was like re one transaction reads, another uh, reads and writes, another transaction reads another object, writes another object, right, so if you execute them under serializability uh, concurrently, one of these transactions will, will abort. Right, the one that, uh, the one whose read validation failed. Kind of to justify such a deletion, there needs to be such situation in the first place, mm -hmm. and not aborting should be the desirable behavior, which is just my kind of a question: is how often is it that you have this pattern, which is not trivial, and you actually want this anomaly to kind of exist? Mm -hmm. so, so, in terms of just like. Implementation techniques, the issue is that in s uh, to implement serializability, you either have to take read locks or do read validation. Right? So that's what people, and f to avoid phantoms, you have to do it in pretty extreme ways, which is you have to, for example, lock the whole table or do some very heavy validations. Maybe there are some uh, impossibility results that sort of formalize what you uh, lose by tying yourself to serializability uh, as opposed to snapshot isolation. Uh, I can't remember anything, but maybe there, maybe there is something. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, then in performance, right? So people want to, you know, so, so the thing is, pro I guess programmers, they're not aware of, uh, of these issues very well, right? And so if you suddenly are increase your isolation level, then you'll take a performance hit, right? And they're like, oh, wow, but it's now it's running slower. Well, maybe your previous application wasn't correct, right? There's a bit of like an maybe historical thing in inertia, right? So they were set very low. Now, if you want to set them higher, the question is, was like, well, why are you doing this? Now my application is running slower. Uh, some, what, sorry? Some. Uh, would, would this performance degradation be uh, only some of the queries? Some of the I mean, uh, uh, queries. Are so yeah, but uh, I mean, I, well, usually uh, the thing is usually uh, like, for example, what you know, database vendors do is they run TPCC and report the numbers, right? So you run TPCC on the one level, the other level you can see the difference, right? And so they were like, oh, well, this level we get better numbers. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, but you have to convince them that, that it's unsafe. I uh, I mean, I don't have a good answer, really, for your question. Maybe I should have started with this, right? So, I mean, I, this is, the, the, my, my moral kind of opinion is that snapshot isolation is okay. Anything weaker doesn't have the right to exist unless you're dealing with sort of uh, all the mobile or geo-replicated scenarios where you kind of have to go for, like, really offline operation and weaker levels. But, but I think this opinion is not shared widely in industry. Um, Uh, 
Oh, deadlocks, uh, so, well, deadlocks, they hit performance, right? Because that, you know, you abort transactions and you also get stuck for a while, right? Uh, so so that, that, you know, that sort of goes into performance. Another thing that I heard uh, is that um, so because, uh, so sometimes uh, when you cannot acquire, if it's an interactive transaction, you cannot acquire a lock, uh, you get an exception or you, f you fail the validation, right? And so people like things like read committed uh, because they don't throw exceptions. Yes, they're incorrect, but they don't throw exceptions, right? <laughs> no, so, but you have to explain. So, 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 so you have to give these lectures. If you want to convince the developer, you have to give them this to our lecture about right about isolation laws. Make sure they understand what you're saying, right? And then go with them over their application and check if you know if it's all right, right? So I guess the people don't go through this uh, through the, this exercise. Uh, Uh, yeah, sure, but the problem is that these databases are used by like everybody, right? Uh, including, absolutely. including not high. You know, the, this is a bread and butter, right? I'm not talking about high-end stuff here, right? <laughs> you know. In, in my experience, for ten years as architect of databases, I used risk committed probably twice, and both of both example was uh, in injection of data. So if I had a very high throughput, mm. some kind of loss or whatever, I could easily refine, duplicate whatever is going in so mass. Later on, the database, but mm. I have a, a huge problem. I, I okay. need to inject a database terabytes of data in a hour, mm. even two hours. Okay. So, so no what uh, one database administrator told me is that if you ask a random developer which isolation level your database is running on, uh, they uh, don't they don't even know what you're talking right. about. So it's, it's whatever the default was set. It's that, and the default is read committed for Postgres, read, re, repeatable read for MySQL, which are both extremely weird. Now, if you are smart and you're high-end, then you can probably understand what you're doing. Great, and unfortunately, you know, 90, the other 90% of developers are not like that, right? Okay, um, yeah. Oh, uh, it's the, well. The the way I presented the algorithm, there are no deadlocks because I presented in a, in a purely optimistic way. But as I mentioned before, one way to actually implement this is to use locks. Uh, so when you acquire something, when you do a write, you acquire the lock and hold it until the end of the transaction. Uh, so not, you don't acquire read locks, but you acquire write locks, right? Uh, that ensures that your write conflict detection check automatically passes because nobody could uh, could write anything. Uh, in that case, the deadlock will be the same example as I showed for serializability. You know, I write to X and Y, you write to Y and X, and so one of them, one of us, will have to abort, right? Okay. Is that uh, is that it? With uh, with group therapy about isolation levels, uh, okay, um, okay, fine. So uh, so this is the uh, the zoo of levels that I've presented, uh, right? So serializability and snapshot isolation, which is the same as Postgres, uh, so what they call repeatable read in Postgres. You know, MySQL repeatable read and read committed, uh, right? And now I'm gonna just this is the very last segment at the very end. Uh, I'm gonna make it a bit less depressing. I'm actually gonna talk about something even stronger. So as I said, serializability is actually not the strongest, um, not the strongest level, and you know there was this question how it relates to linearizability and uh, there's a question. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Okay. So uh, you said that snapshot isolation, like it's weak enough, and there's no need to abort first. Uh, could you explain why? Uh, th this is perf this is perfectly my personal opinion uh, based on sort of aesthetics, right? So in the sense that this is, this is not right, but really. Like, okay, I mean, I can, I have a bit of it. Let me give it just a bit more technical explanation. So the, uh, but okay, so maybe I don't have enough, you know, I didn't never injected terabytes of data in, into my database, right? So maybe, you know, I, I'm an academic, right? Uh, but uh, so, so here you disallow lost updates. Uh, here you allow uh, lost updates, at least if you don't do strange things. So why in the world would you allow lost updates, right? So there is a reason, right? It's either offline operation 
is this is all this eventual consistency business. So offline operation, you're on your phone and you're editing shopping list and your wife is editing the shopping list and maybe you conflict, so okay, this will get uploaded, we'll have to merge or declare conflict, you know, expose the conflict to the user. Or uh, geo-replication, uh, where there are data centers, one data center on the west coast, one data center on the east coast of the US, one data center on the west coast, the center in Europe, where the latency has very high, so it's too expensive to go to another place and say, are you writing the same data, right? Like so that, but this is no, not the setting. I'm talking about just usual databases that run, you know, either on uh, one server or some distributed uh, versions, but not these kinds of fancy stuff. So in this case, in this case, it sort of makes sense to do lost updates, and there are other ways of coping with it. You know, you may have heard of CRDTs, uh, sort of you know, to merge database. You know, when you use Google Docs, it's kind of that case, right? It, when you type something, it doesn't immediately go to the Google server and check if there's a conflict with somebody, right? Right, but uh, you know, but he so here it's sort of okay. Here it starts getting you know weirder. But this is a very you know personal opinion. Right? Um, okay, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, some stronger things, uh, levels that preserve the real time order, which is more like the analogs of linearizability, where you actually do care about uh, the order between operations. Uh, so yeah, as I so, you know, I made this joke about fifty shades of consistency. Now probably it's not a joke. There are probably fifty. It's just you know this diagram is not you know if you especially if you start going into the details about what's the border transactions or how you combine things, right? Um, and so okay, so here is one more. So let's uh, recall serializability. So we serializability said okay, consider history H. Let's say this one. Uh, then H is serializable if it's committed transactions can be totally ordered so that I get a valid sequential execution, right? So in this case, I could like throw away the aborted transaction, uh, order transactions in some way and check that all the reads are okay, right? And uh, everything is fine. Now, the problem is that uh, the serializability uh, doesn't take into account the order in which clients issue uh, these transactions, right? So at all, they just have a bag of transactions, the database is allowed to process them in whatever way uh, it wants. Now, of course, in reality, it doesn't work like this. Uh, and the, uh, you know, the, what the problem that the users get is that they essentially read stale data. Uh, let me demonstrate this by an example. So let's say we have a one client who uh, writes one to X and then commits. And then another client who later in real time, the real time, let's say real time in the time in the universe, right? So the physics, right? So not the time on your machine because that's never completely accurate no, in real time. There's another transaction where she uh, reads uh, um, X, right, and get zero, right, and then it commits, right. So in principle, uh, the w so the weird thing here is that uh, this transaction finished uh, before this transaction even started, but this transaction doesn't see the transaction T2 uh, doesn't see the transaction T1, right. And so this history is actually serializable because serializability doesn't take this relationship uh, into account, and I can just take uh, T2 and then T1 as the serialization, right, and it's gonna be all right. Okay. Uh, now, to some extent, this is a useful weakness uh, because, uh, for example, most of the databases they allow you to have read-only replicas, right? So, some special servers that where you can't write data, uh, but your best effort ship the data there, and you can serve reads from them. Now, of course, these reads are stale because uh, you know uh, the, the data is shipped best effort, uh, right? But serializability allows you to do that, so so that's nice. But this is problematic when clients are allowed to communicate out of band, not through the database, right? So this, uh, uh, this client uh, can uh, commit this transaction, then send a message uh, to this client, and then say, hey, I've done this transaction, you should be able to see my write. And then this transaction checks and the write is not there, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that that too. Yeah, so yeah, which is even worse. It's one of the cases. Yeah, yeah. So there is something called session guarantees that this allows just that, right? But just I'm not, you know, people are gonna be probably, you know, you know, you had to get a headache from so many definitions anyway. So I didn't talk about this, right? Um, okay. So um, yeah, and so this message may either be an explicit message between two threads or two machines, or it may be just using another database, right, as a service. So somebody in the coffee break saying TikTok. So I guess this is the millennials, you know, I post a message on TikTok saying I did it, <laughs> right? Um, so okay, um, and so uh, to disallow this, uh, there's something called strict serializability, 
which this allows the, these kinds of behaviors. So you can also uh, hear people talking about external consistency. So we want external consistency. That means uh, we want to disallow uh, these kinds of behaviors. Um, so to, our, to define it, I'm going to use the notion of the real-time order. Uh, so this is a relation on transactions that essentially formalizes this relationship. Uh, so one transaction, T1, uh, precedes in real time a transaction T2 if T1 finishes before uh, T2 starts. Right? And so uh, this essentially records the orderings that give the clients an opportunity to communicate. That's why we take this particular relation, not some other one. And so these are the intervals where the clients can communicate. Uh, and uh, you know, addressing uh, Panagiotas' question, uh, the, is this also covers the uh, transactions by the same client, right? So if I have a client that does one transaction T1 and then another transaction T2, then these transactions will be, of course, in, in the real-time order uh, relation. So uh, the database will have to respect that as well. Okay, and in general, uh, we may have some more complex cases, uh, like for example, this history where um, not all transactions, so some transactions are concurrent and some transactions precede another one, right? So for example, here, what we have is that T1 uh, finishes before either T2 or T3 starts. So the real-time order relation goes like this like, and like this. But T2 and T3, they are unrelated by real-time order, right? So they are concurrent, right? And so for them, real-time order, any criterion that uses real-time order doesn't say anything. So the relation is going to be like this, where T2 and T3 are, are unrelated. Right? And now, uh, to uh, define this a bit more formally, I'll uh, redefine my notion of histories. Right? So our history, as I said, say, records the interactions between the clients and the database in a single execution. And before, uh, I said this included the operations clients did the transactions, values they read, whether a transaction commits or abort, uh, and also the real-time order uh, in between transactions. This is what I'm going to do now. Right? So before, I didn't have this. Now I'm going to add the, uh, the real-time order. So I'm going to say uh, I consider that this is observable to clients and they care about this. Right? And so this will be uh, in my histories. And now uh, the definition of strict serializability using this notion of history is going to be like this. Uh, so consider a history H. So as an example, I'll first take something very simple, say uh, two transactions, both of them commit. Uh, and uh, one of them, T1, precedes the other in the real-time order. So this was our previous example where one transaction writes one to x and the other doesn't see this write, so read zero, right? And then uh, this history h is strictly serializable. Uh, if it's committed transactions, uh, can be totally ordered, not in any way, before it was just totally ordered. Now it's totally ordered in a way consistent with their real-time order, right? Uh, so that I get a sequential execution, right? So when I define my sequential execution, I cannot contradict uh, this relation. I have to put T1. Before T2, I cannot put the reverse. Now in this example, because it's very simple, that means that the, there is only one possible serialization. It's T1 first, uh, T2 second, and then this is not a valid sequential execution because I cannot read zero if I had the write of one before. Right? And then a database is strictly serializable if it produces uh, only strictly serializable histories. Um, and now to take a more complex example, right, so let's take this other example I had where uh, not all transactions are related by the uh, real-time relation. So we have uh, three transactions, uh, T1 precedes T2, uh, T1 precedes T3 as well, and then T2 and T3 are unrelated. Uh, then, uh, okay, so to get a serialization, that means I have to put T1 first because it goes before all, both of these transactions. But T2 and T3, I can order them in whichever when I, way I like as long as I get a sequential execution, right? And so that means, okay, T1 goes first, and you know, here I have done my homework, so I put T3 first, T2 second, and we, you know, if you check all the reads, you'll, you'll check that actually they're all right. So uh, for example, here we have a uh, read of uh, Y fetching two, the previous write is two, uh, right? Uh, same thing here, right? And then we have a write of Y to, uh, to four, but that goes after these reads, so it doesn't screw anything, anything up. Right. And so this is the, uh, the definition of uh, strict serializability. And now to tie this together with uh, the previous lecture that you heard about uh, linearizability. So I, I've presented to you two versions of serializability. There is the strict serializability that's on what's on the slide. And then there is uh, just serializability, kind of let's call it plain serializability that was before that doesn't take uh, into account any order on transactions of how clients uh, submit them. Now, if you specialize uh, these definitions to kind of degenerate transactions that do just one operation, either a read or a write, and always commit, 
uh, you get criteria for just usual objects where you do a single operation. And so for strict serializability, in this case, uh, this definition will degenerate into linearizability, because linearizability said the same thing, you have to preserve uh, the real-time order. And plain serializability will degenerate into something called sequential consistency, which is kind of like linearizability, but without uh, the real-time order preservation. So this is actually what's used in sort of multiprocessors and this other area that I, I'm not going to talk about today. Okay. Um, and, uh, and strict to phase locking, so before I, I argued that it provides serializability, in fact it provides strict serializability uh, because, uh, well, so before I explained that our strict to phase locking ensures that a transaction, uh, if I do it, have a transaction that does some reads and writes, then uh, these, re these operations, they produce the same outcome as if I uh, executed uh, the transaction at this point uh, when the uh, commit starts, so the serialization was the order of the commit calls. And then of course, if I have another transaction that, uh, that starts after this commit finishes, then everything that uh, this transaction did will be immediately visible here. We don't even have multi-versioning, you just write the data into the database. If you start a transaction later, you, you'll see this data, okay? Yeah. Uh, go louder, please. Uh, no, just it's any set of transactions. Uh, yeah, uh, it's sometimes... Uh, well, maybe I got it wrong, let's see. Uh, uh, no, no, it will solve the issue just by the fact that it's not even two-phase long, it's just by the fact that it's not a multi-version data, you know, not a multi-version database, so you write the data into the, straight into the database. Any, anything that comes after will see that piece of data, right? So let's say, take example, right? So one transaction writes to X, another transaction writes to Y. So they occur in, in, this is the order in which they occur, right? So the first transaction will go, quite lock on X, do the right, commit, release the log. Second transaction will do the same with Y. Now if there is a third transaction that reads X and Y, if it sees the right to Y, it also sees the right to X. Oh, well, in that case, it's kind of anything is vacuous because you didn't see, uh, you didn't read anything. So, <laughs> so, so, so you kind of the definition, uh, like uh, uh, the definition said, yes, yeah, sure, the, this uh, this history is uh, is well. I mean, the definition. Let, let's see. Uh, I mean, I can order them like whatever this the real time order. I can order them like this. And it's going to be a valid sequential execution because you didn't do any reads. There is nothing to check. Uh, it will be possible because you can order these, uh, so again, whatever the real-time order between these X and Y, just order them according to the real-time order, put Z somewhere. I mean, the value fetched by Z will be right because X and Y, they didn't influence it, right? Yeah. Sorry, I think, uh, Maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. But I'm, well, uh, I'm giving you the general, maybe I sort of, maybe I misunderstood the question, but I'm giving you the general definition that works for all cases, right? If you have transactions that, you know, if you have examples where you don't even read or you don't read uh, anything from those transactions that related by real-time order, then, y you know, okay, there's nothing important going on here. Right. Any other questions? Okay. Um, okay, and so um, so there is the, okay so there is strict serializability. There is serializability. Uh, the single host databases they uh, usually guarantee strict serializability. Actually, this goes back to this point that if you kind of don't use anything fancy, you just write data to to the memory, then of course the next transaction that comes along will see it. But they don't often uh, emphasize this in the documentation. For example, there's this, this report. Um, by the Jepson guy where he found a bunch of bugs in Postgres and in, apart from bugs he said that well the, it looks like from testing that the uh, 
Uh, the, his the histories that I get are actually consistent with strict serializability and, well, it's not strong snapshot isolations like analog for snapshot isolation that I'll talk about uh, if, um, uh, if there is time. And he says, well, you know, we, we don't know if it's intentional, but if it is, then, you know, you should say it in the documentation. So unfortunately, they, they didn't. Uh, but if a single host database is not a, not a big surprise, uh, it's more challenging uh, to provide uh, the strict version with uh, when you have distribution and replication, especially geo-replication. And so uh, vendors that uh, manage to achieve this, they shout about this quite loudly. And by far, the most famous paper in this uh, in the space is Spanner, which is a system from 10 years ago by, go by Google, where they, they said, oh, we get strict serialized boot in a sort of very challenging setting. OK, so now uh, I've told you about the, uh, the definition of strict serializability. Uh, and I'm going to address some confusions about this definition. So, so it was like with serializability, there are some controversies. Um, so uh, the confusions usually uh, go as non-guarantees. So people think something is uh, kind of bad, but actually it's okay according to strict serializability. So let me, uh, let me explain this uh, by an example. So let's take our previous history uh, where there are three transactions, right? T1, T2, T3, and T2 and T3 are concurrent, right? So um, the real-time order is defined based on uh, the precedence between the end of the transaction and the start of the transaction, right? So here we have this real-time order. We don't have any edges between T2 and T3, right? Um, now, so you don't take into account any orderings between, say, the start times or the commit times. If this transaction T2, it started before T3, but it doesn't mean that it, you get any extra guarantees because of that, right? So you get guarantees here, you don't guar get guarantees here. So for example, if I flip this history like this, where T3 uh, starts before T2, then the real-time order relation stays the same, right? So again, you can sometimes say people, oh, you, you know, this started earlier, you know, maybe you should get like more up-to-date data, not necessarily. Strict sales booty um, doesn't uh, guarantee anything. Um, and in particular, uh, it doesn't take into account any timestamps. So if you use some timestamps inside your database implementation, for example, you're, you're using multi-version concurrency control, you were using some timestamps, these timestamps, they can, you can do whatever you want with them, uh, right? As long as you guarantee uh, this real-time order relation. You, the timestamps, they don't have to follow anything else. Right, and this is because uh, the clients, they can't actually measure start and commit times perfectly. So let me explain well, why. So I wrote this, uh, I drew this diagram as though clients execute transactions, right? Now, actually, it's the database execu who executes transactions. It just didn't fit onto the slide. So really, what you have is this. You have the client, which sits, you know, maybe on one machine. And there is the database node, which may be another server, right? And if the client wants to execute a transaction, then it will send a message to the database, say, hey, I have a transaction to execute. Please do this, right? Then the database will do its work, you know, maybe, you know, start a transaction, do the right, commit, right? And then return to the client and say, hey, yeah, great. Uh, the transaction committed is done, right? So now the problem is that if the database used some time, like 10, right, and maybe even generated uh, commit timestamps uh, out of the real-time clock, so the commit timestamp here was 10, uh, then by the time this message gets to the client, uh, at the client it may be like 15, right, so later, or it may be 5 because of clock skews. Right, so clocks at different machines, they're out of sync, right? And so if you sort of measure the times at the client and say this transaction finished at this time, uh, or started at this time, uh, you cannot make any conclusions based on that because these times don't correspond to what database did and anyway, you shouldn't rely on database implementation details, right? So all that matters is that uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, all that matters is that the, uh, uh, the real-time order relation is preserved. Anything else, the times of the start and commit, uh, they don't matter, right? Uh, and then there is another subtlety. So I drew this picture uh, as if I execute stored procedures, right? So here I send a message saying, here's my whole transaction, please execute it. The database does its work and returns the results. Well, actually, uh, what often happens is you may have interactive transactions. So somebody uh, brought this up. Now, that means that the picture looks uh, kind of like this where the client says, okay, I'd like to start a transaction. Okay, fine, we started it. Then the client can think, you know, maybe get some data from somewhere saying, okay, fine, I want to do this operation. So please write me this piece of data. So database will uh, do this work, uh, return to the client. Then the client thinks again, maybe consult some local data structures and says, okay, let's commit the transaction. Then the database uh, returns and says, yeah, okay, the transaction is, uh, is, has committed, right? So these interactive transactions and then the clients can 
execute one operation at a time, and in between operations, they can do e either local computation or they can do other stuff like communicating with other machines, right? And so then uh, this leads to kind of subtle situations. So let's say, uh, let's take this example. Let's say we have one client who started a transaction T1, right? And then maybe read an object X. Let's say he gets the uh, zero value, the, the default value. Then the client falls asleep, right? So this is an interactive transaction. So the control flow returned to the client and the client went and tried to do something else. Uh, and then there is another client that also starts an, another transaction, T2, uh, writes uh, to some object, say Y, right? And then commits, right? So now here there is this relationship that our, this, uh, opera this client started this transaction, in fact, did some operation before this transaction started, right? Now this ordering is not taken into account by uh, strict serializability because as far as strict serializability is concerned, uh, these transactions are, are concurrent. So what may happen is that now this client may wake up and for example, read uh, one from Y, right? Uh, and then commit. And that would be perfectly fine uh, with strict serializability uh, because T1 and T2 are concurrent. I can order them in whichever way I like. And so I can order uh, T2 first, where you have the right to Y, and then uh, T1. So here you have a right to X, which T2 didn't do anything with. And then uh, you read the right to Y by T2, right? Um, and so. Uh, this behavior may not happen in an optimistic implementation where by this time you would have fixed your snapshot from which you're uh, reading, all right? And so you wouldn't see uh, this right because it falls outside the snapshot. But it does actually happen uh, in a uh, log-based one, like two-phase locking, right? So I, you know, I could, can lock X here, then fall asleep, then somebody locks Y, does its update, unlocks, then I lock Y here, read the update, and that's it, right? So in two-phase locking, this is, so okay, is everybody all right with the two-phase locking part? Yeah, okay, right. And so with, with, uh, with snapshot-based implementation, you wouldn't get this because the snapshot kind of cuts it over here, so you, you wouldn't see it, okay? And so really, the, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, so the, I'll get to snapshot isolation, but the thing is there was a fine print in snapshot isolation where the, uh, uh, when you select the start timestamp, it can be non-deterministic. Uh, it's non-deterministic computation. You can have any, any timestamp, even the timestamp that's very much in the past. And so it allows you to read stale data, right? So I, um, well, okay, I said this, but I didn't emphasize this, right? But so if I have time, I'll cover this in the next slides. Um, okay, um, and so so this example may happen. It's allowed by strict serializability. The the reason why people allow this is that well, you want to allow a range of possible implementations. You don't want to say this only works for log-based implementations or for only for optimistic uh, implementations. Um, but this means that uh, even if you have a database providing strict serializability, clients have to be uh, careful when they communicate because here this client could, in principle, you know, start this uh, operation, right? So finish this read and then send the message to this client and then this client say, does this transaction and then, okay, so they, the, this client may expect that if he, it does something because, you know, this transaction already started, then what it should do, shouldn't, what it does here shouldn't affect uh, this transaction T1, but that's not the case, right? So, uh, so as I said, the real-time order and preservation and strict serializability, they guarantee to the clients that they can communicate outside transactions without surprises. If I commit a transaction and send you a message, then you'll see what I did, that's great. But if you communicate from within a transaction, there are no guarantees. You are on, you know, you're on your own, you either shouldn't rely on anything, or if you're using a very particular database implementation, you should look at what it does and see if you know, it provides you any additional guarantees. And you won't be portable in this case, okay? Okay, and so our, so to summarize, as I said, strict serializability uh, allows clients to communicate uh, outside transactions. It also uh, makes it easier to compose uh, different uh, services because uh, this communication may involve using another database or another service, right? And that means you really use something else is gonna be all right, right? As long as you do it outside transactions, that's the, that's the fine print, okay? 
Um, and now I'm going to quickly go over the same thing with snapshot isolation, so this will address your question. So uh, actually, snapshot isolation, the vanilla version, also allows reading stale data, because the uh, uh, SI algorithm allows our uh, assigning old start timestamps uh, to transactions. So the original paper kind of said it, put it like this, that we allow uh, to run transactions with very old timestamps, thereby allowing them to time travel, taking a historical perspective of the database. Um, and uh, so as I said before, the, the SI is defined by the abstract algorithm, right? And that any history uh, produced by real database implementation has to be produced by this algorithm. And the algorithm is non-deterministic, right? Uh, so uh, to recap, I had these timestamps, uh, which are like integers, like which are integers, but uh, function like a virtual time, right? And there was the start timestamp, and uh, that's used to serve reads, right? And the commit timestamp, which is computed at, computed at commit time, right? So then you have optimistic execution, so writes are buffered uh, during transaction execution and only added to the database at commit time, tagged by uh, the commit timestamp. And so the, uh, I didn't emphasize, but the start timestamp can be any time before the first read of T, right? So I have to fi fix it before I read, because otherwise I don't know what I, what I should be reading, but can be anything, right? Uh, again, this is useful are either when you use uh, real time to implement, uh, especially with distributed versions, when you use real time to implement um, a snapshot isolation, uh, you, because of clock skews, you don't have a guarantee that uh, you, the uh, start timestamp you assign will be higher than the timestamp of any other transaction completed in the system, because that transaction may have been done on a different node. So that's kind of useful, right? But this allows this uh, example with reading stale data. So I can uh, have a user who uh, opens a transaction, uh, writes one to X, uh, then at the timestamp uh, timeline, uh, I may assign, say, our uh, T1, uh, start timestamp 10. And then, uh, let's say I commit it with timestamp, uh, commit timestamp 20. Uh, and then another user uh, may uh, open a transaction later, uh, right, to, read, to read from X. Right? So according to the algorithm, it is possible to assign timestamp, say, 5 uh, to T2, because right? you, you have that flexibility. And then T2 can commit and, uh, you know, and get a timestamp uh, 30. Um, and so as I said, in distributed implementation, the, this may be caused by clock skews. If these two transactions are processed by uh, different machines, and these two machines assign start timestamp from real-time clock, it may well be that one machine has uh, time above 20, and the other machine has only time 5. Right? And so you'll get these, uh, these kinds of issues. Okay. Um, and uh, this is actually, uh, actually this affects performance because let's uh, imagine that uh, here instead of just reading X, I'm also uh, writing to X. Let's say I want to write one to X. Uh, then uh, we have write conflict detection, right? In the write conflict detection, the rule says that uh, I have to abort uh, T2 if another transaction uh, wrote to the same object as T2 uh, during its lifetime, right? And T2, uh, this is the lifetime from 5 to 30. Uh, T2 wrote to X, and there is another transaction that uh, also wrote to X uh, with commit timestamp 20, right? Now, according to the time in the universe, uh, actually T1 was like over here, right? But the algorithm doesn't know that. It thinks that T1 has timestamp 20, so falls into this interval, right? And so in this case, the algorithm will have to actually abort uh, T2. And so uh, all timestamps, uh, you have the flexibility to assign them, but uh, you may get performance hit because of writes. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so like in the case of serializability, in serializability we had strict serializability. Here there is something called strong snapshot isolation. Uh, the, the reason why it's strong and not strict is purely accidental, just was a different paper. And so it's the same story. We can strengthen snapshot isolation uh, to disallow this kind of uh, weird behaviors, and that's very simple. All we do is we add this uh, additional constraint that uh, the start timestamp must be higher than pre any previously assigned commit timestamp. Right? Um, so in our example here, uh, there is a real-time order relation between uh, these two transactions, and so this will guarantee that the start timestamp of uh, this transaction will be higher than the commit timestamp of this transaction. 
Well, why? Well, you, we process them because of the real-time order. Uh, the database process has to process them in this order. So we uh, first open T1, uh, say, let's say it gets timestamp 10. Uh, then we commit T1, let's say with timestamp 20. Uh, then uh, we start T2, and in this case, the database has no flexibility to assign uh, the start timestamp to, to, to T2 that is less than 20, which was already been assigned. Right? And so then it has to be something greater, say 30. Uh, then that means that I cannot read zero because uh, the snapshot is uh, taken over here. It includes everything that was done before, including this write uh, to x. OK. Um, and uh, right. OK. Right. And that means that uh, there are no surprises when clients communicate out of band, right? So I can, uh, I can send a message, and I will know that this transaction will actually read one. OK, so, uh, so now we get a bit more uh, species into our zoo of uh, isolation levels. So before there was serializability and snapshot isolation, so now there's kind of another dimension where you have strict serializability and strong snapshot isolation that add this uh, real-time order constraint. Uh, these pairs are just incomparable, right? And so sort of the graph grows until you get uh, 50 shades. Um, and then just to make this a bit more complicated, actually, uh, or, uh, as I said before, you always have read replicas, right? So even if you have, provide, have a database that generally provides strict serializability, usually you would have uh, some replicas that just serve reads that are potentially stale. And there are actually definitions that also allow mixing these two things, whereas like, which operations can read stale data in your database, which your operation cannot. So uh, there are some references to papers if you're interested. Uh, and uh, I think that's uh, basically it. So uh, to conclude, our uh, database isolation levels are non-trivial, as you can see from the faces, tight faces of the people uh, present. And this is uh, what's more surprising is that it's even the case for sort of strong levels, because then there are different subtleties. Do you provide any guarantees uh, to aborted transactions? Do you preserve reveal, time order, et cetera? Um, but you can sort of uh, still think a bit, bring a bit of clarity uh, if you kind of are a bit systematic. And one picture I want to kind of you to take away from this is this, where we kind of draw this line between the database implementation and the clients doing the transactions. And when we talk about the specification, we talk below the line, right? It's what the clients see. Uh, we don't talk about like the internal details, like what timestamps you use, uh, is it distributed replicated implication implementation? Does it use optimistic concurrency control or pessimistic concurrency control? Uh, and this is even the case when the specification def is defined by abstract algorithm, right? So in this case, just the abstract algorithm is only a means to um, generate a set of histories. Um, so that's uh, pretty much the end of my course. Uh, a small advertisement, uh, I'm hiring. If you want to do a PhD on either this topic or another one in pretty Madrid, uh, please get in touch with me. Our building is somewhat uh, more modern. And uh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you.